Psalm 44. We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days, in the times of old. How thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand, and plantest them. How thou didst afflict the people, and cast them out. For they got, no, got not the land in possession, but their own sword. Neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand and thine arm, in the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. Thou art my king, O God. Command deliverance for Jacob. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under the rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. But thou hast saved us from our enemies, and hast put them to shame that hated us. In God we boast all the day long, and praise thy name forever, Selah. But thou hast cast off and put us to shame, and goest not forth with our armies. Thou makest us to turn back from the enemy, and they which hate us spoil for themselves. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat, and hast scattered us among the heathen. Thou sellest thy people for naught, and dost not increase thy wealth by their price. Thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. My confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. For the voice of him that we approacheth, and blasphemed, by reason of the enemy and avenger. All this is come upon us, yet have we not forgotten thee, neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. Our heart is not turned back, neither have our steps declined from thy way. Through thou hast sent broken us in the place of dragons, and covered us with the shadow of death. If we have forgotten the name of our God, or stretched out our hands to a strange God, Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Yea, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. Wherefore hiddest thou thy face, and forgottest our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust, and our belly cleaveth unto the earth. Arise for our help, and redeem us for thy mercy's, mercy's sake. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that you've done for us, and thank you for everything that you've done for this church. Today, I would ask that you would bless Brother Josh to preach a very good sermon. Amen. 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 Psalm 144 there. Psalm 144. Takes an interesting turn there, right around that Selah in verse 8. What I'm talking about today in Psalm chapter 44 is carry on without complaint. How to carry on without complaint. So I'm just going to walk through this sermon, uh, through this psalm actually, and, and just talk about how, you know, I had no idea what I was going to preach, and I figured out, you know, finished up studying uh, for the first sermon, and, and, you know, just as I was kind of wrapping up to go to bed, uh, this was just open, and I read through Psalm 44, and I said, well, there you go. That's relevant, seemingly, to the situation that we have right now, relevant to the time, relevant to the, the new year rolling over, and so I'm, I'm excited that the Lord would, would uh, count me worthy to show me some things from His Word, and I just pray, God, that it would be a blessing. Uh, first thing that you notice as we talk about how to carry on without complaint, carry on without complaint. In verse 1, it says, we have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days, in the times of old. First thing that we see is it, it's a we. It's, a, it's an assembly of people saying, Lord, we have heard. And these people are talking from the point of present, but we can also consider this as if it was somebody in the future talking about even what's happening to us now. It's always somebody in a future time looking back is what I'm pointing out. And that's, that's we. It says we have heard. They heard it with their ears. They were recalling this history that was told to them of their fathers. In the case of the scriptures, they are hearing of both verbally 
and through the word of God, the things that God has done, the works that he has done. The Bible says here, it says, we have heard what our fathers have told us, what work thou didst in the days, in their days, in the times of old. And specifically what's being referred to, I believe, is yes, the words that are revealed to us in the scriptures, but also, if, if I can put it this way, extra biblical things that the Lord has done. And that's not blasphemous to say that, because we know if you look in John chapter 20, John chapter 20 and verse 30, this is recorded very plainly, John chapter 20 verse 30, that, that many such things, the Bible says, I'm going to find it myself so I don't misquote it, I thought I had it booked out, John chapter 20 and in verse 30, the Bible says, and many other signs Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And it goes on to say, these are written that you might believe. So we know that God does many things in many ways at many different times in all of our lives. So it wouldn't be unusual for these people to hear stories from their fathers what work God did in their days. And myself included, I, I can even look back and yeah, all of the things that have went on with me in the last four or five months aren't things that I can necessarily point to a, you in a scripture and say, hey, this happened in my life. Although those, those situations do exist where I, I go, hey, that sermon when that was preached, I had no idea it was for such and such a time. I had no idea that it was going to speak to me in that way. And yet God took a scripture and made it relevant to my life at the time, applied it directly to me, and I was blessed thereby. And so I can point to scriptures and say, hey, that is how God worked in my days and I could tell that to somebody else but there's been many other things just in regard to this church in particular that we would look back and say yeah in the times of old such and such happened but this is only five months ago we're talking about and yet there's so many things that I could share with my children there's so many things that I could share with spiritual children about what God has done what works he has done in these days and I could tell that to somebody down the line they could tell it to somebody else the great truths and the great things that God has done through my life if you look in verse 2 you find very particularly that the glory is in fact his it says how thou didst drive out how thou we got to give God the glory we got to give God the glory for everything that's going on in our lives and, and everything even he's revealing to us in our scriptures. How thou didst drive. And as I read through this passage, I find constantly the people that are talking about what their fathers have taught them of the great works that thou hast done. I find exactly that. Thou didst drive out. It talks about thy hand. Thou, thy right hand and thine arm in the light of thy countenance. Thou hadst favor. Thou art my king. Uh, through thee will we push down through thy name will, and they're just constantly giving God the glory for everything that has happened in their days and the people after them saw that they said these are the things that thou hast done in their lives giving God the proper glory for it what are some of the things in the context of this scripture that were done in these people's lives how thou didst drive out the heathen there in verse 2 how thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantest them. And didn't that happen in our situation? I was, in fact, completely engulfed in it at this point, though I did play a small part, and I was partaker of it only through fellowship and, a, and knit hearts. But did we not see the heathen driven out before us? Did we not see uh, the Bill Lunatic money grubber going after our people, and yet God completely removing that heathen from the situation by his own hand? We didn't have much to do with that, but we did notice that, that the Lord found a way of actually separating, removing that heathen out of the situation in order that he might plant them. There's two groups being there. Thou didst drive out the heathen with thine hand and plantest them. Who's the them? Those are the fathers. Those are the people that were partakers of the grace of God, partakers of his glory with thy hand very specifically and we saw that even even as we we grew together we saw that in, in my life particularly that that i had at one point had a prayer that i wanted to be more involved in ministry whatever that meant 
And as I prayed that out to God, I had no idea that he was going to move me in that area. I thought I was going to be involved in my church in London a little bit more. I had no idea that men from Trinity were going to reach out to me um, in order to um, have, have advice, in order to receive a little bit of counsel. I'm wondering why are these men reaching out to me uh, to, and how to handle their situation. I, I have no idea. I have no, um, no bone to pick in this fight. I, 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 I didn't know. I didn't realize. I, I didn't understand. But God was gradually working, and his hand was in my life in that area. And then after that, even, we started to have... Um, we had, we had a situation where, where even Rob had reached out and asked, you know, what would you consider this? And, and he almost put it in a situation where, uh, you know, they're, they're so desperate that it was just like, well, well, you have clothes, come lead us. Just like the Old Testament story, right? <laughs> Anyone will do, right? And I was like, I'm so honored. Thank you. <laughs> and after that, you know, more affirmed that, and we, we started to assemble together. Um, <clears throat> so then, first, we had the heathen removed by the hand of God, but then we also saw the hand of God move in other ways. After we were planted, his hand, after the planting, after we were planted in the land, let's say, after we were rooted, after we were starting to grow, there were those already residing. There were those already abiding within. The Bible says here, thou, thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. I believe God's hand was even upon that, upon, upon those that were planted with us, those that were removed from the Trinity situation, became planted with us. And yet spiritually they became afflicted. Spiritually an inner turmoil came upon them. Spiritually their own minds became evil afflicted towards myself, maybe perhaps my pastor, whatever was going on. They were afflicted and they, they, they couldn't bear it anymore. They couldn't take it anymore. And in, in the long run, they were cast out. I didn't have to do anything to cast them out, but rather they removed themselves and God cast them out. Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9 says, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which didst eat of my bread, and hath lift up his heel against me. But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me, and raise me up, that I may requit them. By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. And I experienced that, that, that while there were friends, while there were loved ones, while there were those that I began to grow with and began to cherish and began to look at as mine own familiar friend, even having bread with them, I noticed very quickly that the, that the countenance had turned. They became evil afflicted towards me, and they were cast out. Yeah, there was no physical casting of them out, but I believe God had his hand on that. God allowed their minds to be turned in order that they would change and they would move on. And you know what? I stand here the same way that I stood back then. Uh, if God goes and uses them in a great way to reach this city, to reach other cities, to do great works for God, I am so happy. I want to see them in church. I want to see them growing. I want to see them being spirit-filled Christians. But for the time being, they have that affliction. They're cast out. And, and I'm okay with that as well. I want to be able to move on with a clear conscience, and that's something that I'm looking at. Look, that situation was such that, that it was just like when you saw in Isaiah chapter 3. They, they, as the haughty daughters of Zion with their stretched forth necks and their wanting eyes, they were walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. The picture of those daughters of Zion is one that they have haughty eyes. In other words, or, or sorry, they have wanton eyes, wanting, desiring, seeking, trying to trying to gain more, trying to get something better, trying to do something better, trying to have 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 notoriety. They they had that stretched forth neck, lifted up, proud, arrogant. They're they're going to do something better with their situation. And they walked and they minced as they go. And the Bible says of those that they were making a tinkling with their feet. And I believe we witnessed that. We, I believe we witnessed that the Lord had his hand in casting them out and removing them from the situation. The Bible records in the context of Isaiah 3, he says, The Lord removed the bravery of their tinkling ornaments. The fleshly, carnal things that they were holding onto were removed from them. Their bravery was removed from them. I think we've even seen a withdrawal, more silence from those that oppose this church. Why? Because they're starting to see the bravery of the carnal things that they were holding on, the carnal reasons that they had in order to uh, justify their spiritually turmoiled and afflicted mind that was evilly afflicted toward us. It's being removed from them. 
And God is exposing, as it does in that context, their secret parts, the secret thoughts, the secret ideas. He's exposing them for who they are. He's revealing, as it did in the context of the wanton daughters of Zion. He's revealing that what we saw as a sweet smell was actually just masking an offensive stink. There, there was an underlying issue that was exposed, praise be to God, and now we can move on from that situation, as I hope and pray with a clear conscience that they will do the same thing. We can all grow, and perhaps down the line there will be great works come from both of these situations. And it won't be a, a means to an end, but rather sound words can continue on doing what sound words is meant to do unto the Lord. And they can go on and do what they're going to do. Verse 3, the Bible says, For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them. But thy right hand and thine arm, and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst favor toward them. So I'm talking about carrying on without complaint. So whether it is, in fact, the heathen that were removed, or the people that were planted, it wasn't by my sword. It wasn't by my arm. If it was by anyone's sword, it was by the sword of the Lord. It was by the word of God being proclaimed, the word of God going forward. That was the sword that divided. That was the sword that put us at, at odds. That was the sword that made the difference in those battles, whether it was the heathen being removed or whether it was the people that we were planted with. It was also not my arm. There was no carnality, I believe, that allowed for me to remove that situation. I felt so close to God as I struggled through that situation. Verse 3 explains, as the people realized, that they got not that land by their own sword. Neither did their own arm save them. But thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance. God's right hand is strength and might that he leads with. God's arm is strength and might that you can lean on. God's light of his countenance is strength and might that you can, you can love on, you can grow to trust in. Verse 4 says, Thou art my king, O God, command deliverances to Jacob. And as the king, we are simply the Lord's servants. The servant looks to the hand of his master, as it says in the uh, Psalm of Decrees, looks to the hand of his master. In other words, when the hand of the king raises, the servant is ready to hear what the next leadership step is going to be. He's ready to give the king what he desires. He's watching the right hand of his master, looking to it in order that he might act. We ought to do the same thing with God. When his hand moves, we ought to be already looking at his hand in order to do exactly what his hand is moving towards doing. We ought to follow after the leading of his hand. The king, and we're just his servants, has everlasting arms then to lean on. Deuteronomy chapter 33 says God has everlasting arms. And those are strong arms. Those are the strongest arms. And we can lean on them. We can be held by them. We can be strengthened by them. He can encourage us with that strong arm. And we are also looked upon by the light of his countenance. Thou art my king, O Lord. Thou art my king. And as the king, he sits high above. He looks down from his lofty height. He sees his people. And he reveals to them themselves. And I love that. That's something that you can learn to love about God is that he sees all. He knows all. He's able to strengthen you because he understands you. Verse 5. Now if it's God, if it's God that lifts us up, if it's God that gives us the deliverance, if it's God that by his right hand and by his arm and by the light of his countenance does to us and within us and through us his own pleasure and his own will and gives us possessions, then who is going to condemn us? Who is going to fight against us? Who is going to push us back from doing what God wants? The Bible says in verse 5, Through thee will we push down our enemies. It doesn't say our great might is going to push down our enemies. It says through thee, through the Lord, will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow. And if there's ever a lesson to learn, it's this. I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. But thou hast saved us from our enemies and hast put them to shame. 
that hated us. In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever, Selah. We need to put our trust more in God. We need to put our trust less in our flesh and in our desires and our needs and our ways and our, our, our plan for things. We need to understand that it is God who has the sword that is mighty to save. It is God that has saved us from our enemies, if there were ever enemies fighting against us. The shame upon them is only because they're fighting against, not us, they're fighting against the Lord. And if we're on the Lord's side, we always have that with us. We always have that strength with us. We always have God on our side if we're simply following after him and allowing him to work in us and to work through us. In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name. So we need to look back on this past year. Yes, I agree. We need to look back and rejoice in what's been done. We need to rejoice in the fact that, that while everything was working against us, including like a, a, a split and a battle and all the things that happened at Trinity, and then afterwards the split and the battle and all the things that happened in the basement, and then everything afterwards, we need to look back on those things, and yet we can rejoice in what's come because of it. We still have a great group of believers, and, and with a small army, God can truly do great things. He uses the base. He uses the humble. He uses the small to confound the wise, to confound those things that are great in this world. And so we can rejoice in the fact that we have gotten all of this distance between us, all of this distance behind us um, <clears throat> to be where we're at now. I mean, I'm rejoicing. This is, this is a great position to be in. And if you look back, it's, it's, it's truly humbling and confounding even to realize that only like four or five months has passed since this all, this all broke out. And I understand that a lot of you, this, this has been a, a battle, unfortunately, that's gone on a little bit longer than even that, <clears throat> given that you were involved in the heart of the, uh, the Trinity debacle. But here we are. We're in a great position to do great things for God, and this year is going to be no exception. We have, for but a small time, had all of these things done through us and we can tell them unto others we can tell them to our children that's kind of the overarching theme that's going on right now is that all of the great things that are being done through God all of the pushing of the enemies all of the lifting up of Christ's name in order that we would rise up above our enemies all of that stuff is being explained now to the next generation it's being explained now to those that follow after and I believe if, if we're steadfast and we're sure, we're going to have that same responsibility and that same pleasure indeed to tell of those that follow after us of all the things that have done. We're going to have children that are raised up after us and we're going to be able to tell them of all the great things which the Lord hath done in growing and building and planting this church. And we're going to be able to explain that to them. Not only just children of the flesh, we're going to have spiritual children that follow after us. That we're going to be able to explain to them all the great things God has done to lead us to this situation. And we can boast, as the Bible says in verse 8, boast all the day long and praise thy name forever, Selah. We can just stop there. We can just rest there boasting in God about all the things that he has done. And we can tell this story to our children and to our children's children. And it can be just part of the great testimony of our lives as a Christian. It would be part of the great testimony of our walk when we tell people where we're at right now in Christ. And it's a, it's a great truth and it's a, it's a great responsibility even to tell of the wonderful things that God has done to our children nor that they would tell it to our children. But we've got to be careful when we do this that we don't forget to focus on the positives and on the negative. See, here's what we do. When we forget those things which are behind and press forward... Quite often what we'll do is we'll lift up all the positives of a situation and we'll completely forget about the negatives. Now understand the Bible does teach forgetting those things which are past we press on. And the context of that is in regard to things that would weigh you down, things that would make you sick, things that are sins, things that are wrongs, things that are hurting your current walk. And I believe, yes, the, the actual things that you have done against the Lord, the actual things that you have done should be put behind you, should be put away from you if they're a hindrance to your walk right now. But what I mean when I say don't lose track of the positives and negatives in the story is, is exactly what we see play out in Psalm chapter 44, where 
they remembered the great things that God had done, the great battles, how his right hand and his arm and the light of his countenance had put down the enemy, had given the enemy a humble spirit, had humiliated, shamed them, and because they hated them, God just rained down shame upon the enemies of those that were planted in the land. Even indeed us, God rains down shame upon those that are fighting against this church because we are in the will of God. When, when that happens, we lift up all the great things that God has done in this situation, and those become the story. And what we're missing then is what happens as you read down. They start talking. They say, but, right after that pause, and God will we boast, verse 8, all the day long, and praise thy name forever, Selah. And then they pause, and then it says, but thou hast cast off and put us to shame. And goes not forth with our armies. What are they missing? They're missing the fact that when the fathers went out to battle, when the fathers um, had God do these great things in their life, that all of the stuff that they're about to list off was present in the father's life. But the story that was told was one of great victory, one of great success, one of great wonder of how God would work in their lives. But they forgot to mention, it seems, to the children here, that there were some hard times mixed in there. There were some negatives mixed in there. Now, I'm not talking about negatives due to sin. Again, forget those things which are past. So when we sin against God and we ask God for forgiveness and he forgives us, we can move on. We can put that back. We don't have to dwell upon it. What negatives I'm more talking about are the attacks, the hatred, the... Um, vehement desire to destroy what God is doing that comes from the enemy, don't forget those things. Because when you forget those things, you're going to think that the story of the beginnings of Sound Words Baptist Church was just hunky-dory, peachy, no problem, everyone's smiling, it was all good. And then when things start going wrong in the next year, you're going to be like, what in the world is happening? And you're going to just be destroyed and ruined and depressed. And you're going to, you're going to have this weird misconception of, of what actually happened in reality and that's going to cause a stumbling block and I'm not talking about those that are here we all know what happened we experienced it we still have scars to prove what we went through over the past few months we have deep hurts I think honestly it's good for us to let go of those hurts where people have harmed us and I'm going to I'm going to do my best to forgive and to forget where I have been personally harmed and attacked by others in this situation, those that I would call friends, or called friends at some point, I'm going to put those things behind me and forget them as I go on to the new year. And that's one of the ways that I am hoping to carry on without complaint. But what we shouldn't forget is the fact that those things happen. You can forgive the hurt of them. You can forget the hurt of them. You can put that behind. But don't forget what happened. Don't forget the attacks. Why? Because if you do, when you tell the story to the new believer, when I tell the story to Caleb, he will think that that's starting a church. He will think that stepping out in faith with God. He will think that 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 taking that job, that leap of faith, that serving his family, he will think that everything, and the children after us will think that everything, and the believers that come into the situation after will think that everything in the Christian life is just perfect and wonderful, and there's never a care and never a problem in the world. And it's a lie. The reality is, is that we're always going to face struggles, and we're always going to face trials. And how do I know that it was not portrayed in that way to these believers? Because the Bible here records great victory of God. It's just time and time again. Thou didst this. Thy hand did this. Thy right hand did this. Thou puttest down them that hated us. Thou puttest down. But I don't think they focused enough on the fact that there was those that hated them. And that's why this transition happened. The Bible says here, thou hast cast off. It continues in verse 10. Thou, now we're talking still about God. We're talking still about the person of the Lord. Thou makest us to turn back from the enemy. And they which hate us spoil for themselves. So I just want to talk about a few things, a few points from the attitude of the children that follow after, the children that have heard the story, the children that have heard of the great victories, of the great wonders of God as he planted them in the land and removed the heathen. Just like that, just removed them. It almost makes it seem like it was just, it was just, 
You know, it's, it's kind of like when, when, when Christ comes in the, in the clouds and he speaks the armies of, of uh, Armageddon. You know, he speaks them out of existence, right? It's just such an easy battle. And that's what God did in their lives. But I think the people that are, the people that are experienced it don't necessarily think that everything's just hunky-dory and easy. And that's, that's what was missing, I believe, in that testimony. So a few things in order for us to carry on into the new year without complaint, or to carry on without maintaining this same kind of complaint of present evil's attitude as we go on into the new year. So we're not blindsided when things go wrong again for us. The, the, and, and so that others that hear of the story of the, of the foundations of this church aren't blindsided when things come upon them. The, the things that we need to do as we go forward are as follows. Look at verse 9 through 12. But thou hast cast off and put us to shame. Thou goest not forth with our armies. Thou makest us to turn back from the enemy. And they which hate us spoil for themselves. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat, and hast scattered us among the heathen. Thou sellest thy people for naught, and dost not increase thy wealth by their price. Don't look at minor spiritual losses as if you have lost favor with God. I believe the Bible here is saying that, that when there is a setback, it's not because God has cast you off. It's not because God is now working for the enemy. It's not as, as if now God has given us away as sheep appointed for meat and we're just refuse unto him. Just because there is a minor spiritual loss in your life, it doesn't mean that you have lost spiritual favor with God. God still loves you. God's still working with you. God's still doing great things in your life. Well, what would a minor spiritual loss be? Well, perhaps somebody you know and love has become backslidden. Perhaps you've fallen behind in the Bible reading plan that you expected to do in the new year, and then you just feel defeated. Well, maybe God's not fair. Perhaps your prayer life starts to wane. Perhaps things start going difficult financially. All these things creep into your life, and you counter that by doing more carnal activity, which we all tend to do. If we find we're, we're falling out financially, we're going to work harder. Well, no, I think we got to pray more. we got to seek Lord more. But we kind of get into our carnal mindset about having to fix the situation instead of recognizing that, that we haven't lost favor with God. And so, yes, there are going to be times when your flesh bulges up and you try to fight your way carnally out of a situation and you're going to have spiritual loss. And when that happens... Just as it kind of happened to these people where they're, where they're saying, hey, we're, we're giving away like me. We're, you're selling thy people. You're, you're, you know, we're, we're worthless because you're not even increasing by it. Don't look at that minor spiritual setback in your life as if you've lost favor with God. As these people, I believe, did. They approached their lives as if it would be just like the story that they've heard in verse 1 through 8. As if God was just going to come in and remove all of their problems. But then, when they realized that their problems were there and they started to carnally get involved and fight and battle and, and try to pull their way out of their situations, they lost some things spiritually. And when they lost some things spiritually, they looked at that as having lost favor with God. And now their, thou hast done great things, has turned into, well, thou hast cast us off. God, you're not even working in my life anymore. Now don't, when you, when you fall a little bit, the just may fall seven times and get it back up again. Right? He had to fall seven times in order to get up that eighth time. Don't look at those seven falls, those seven failures as spiritual losses, and then on that seventh time just give up. No, God is still working your life in the same way, and he's working toward putting shame to your enemies. He's working toward planting you in that new area of your life. But you're going to have minor setbacks along the way. Why? Because the fathers had that same minor setback. It's just it wasn't portrayed properly to the people, or they didn't understand the children that followed after, that that's a part of the Christian life. You gain some, you lose some. You gain some, you lose some. Man, I'm reading my Bible like 10 chapters a day, and then you go 10 days without reading a chapter of your Bible. It's easy to rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall in Christian life, and it's even easier to look at those situations and then just be like, well, God has no favor in my life because my Bible reading isn't what it was last week. My prayer isn't what it was last week. And so I must have fallen out of favor with God. No, don't look at minor spiritual losses as if you have lost favor with God. 
Don't regard, the next thing, don't regard reproach from your neighbor as if it comes by reason of personal error. Look at verse 13. Thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about us. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. My confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. For the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and avenger. Here I believe they're taking what's happening in regard to those around them. And yes, much, 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 much of the reproach that we feel from our neighbor comes not because of God, but because of our relationship with God. For thy sake we are killed all the day long, the Bible later says. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. So it's not because of God, as in it's his actions that are making people to blaspheme and to attack and to contradict. No, 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 no. It's also not God that's doing this because of some sort of personal error that you have in your life, as if he's really trying to get back at you by by turning and swirling and, and mixing and mingling and getting everybody around you hostile against you. No, don't regard that reproach from your neighbor as if it comes by reason of some personal error or some scorn that should be received by you. And I think that tends to be something that we do as well. We will look at situations in our life and be like, man, why is God not allowing my heart to be knit with my wife? Well, why is God making my boss hate me or allowing my boss to hate me or whatever? We tend to look at all of the circumstances, all of the reproach, all of the attacks, as if it's because of some personal error that we did. The reality is, is that they hated Christ and they will hate you. And so just because you are a Christian and in the world, the world must attack you, it, it's not necessarily because, um, because you've done something wrong. And I, I think that, that's the bondage that we get into. But rather because Christ is in you, the hope of glory, they're simply picking on Christ. And that ought to be our goal and that the only reason why, as we talked about a little bit earlier, the only reason why someone would have a charge to levy against you is because, or in the regard, or in the context of your dealings with your God. Don't look at this reproach which the Bible here records as confusion. We know that God's not the author of confusion. That was my little, my little clue there that, that the confusion that is continually before the children here and the shame that is covering their face is not authored by God. Just because your neighbor is reproaching you, it's not necessarily by reason of your own personal error. But it could be simply just the fact that God is working in you to perform what he did to the fathers in putting down your enemies and allowing you to overcome these situations and allowing you to grow by them so that you can tell the next generation and hopefully you'll add on the fact that, hey, the Christian life is not all hunky-dory. It's not easy, that walk. Verse 17, all this is come upon us, yet have we not forgotten thee? Neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. Our heart is not turned back. Neither have our steps declined from thy way. Though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death. Don't forget that God is here. Don't forget God or decline from his ways. And that's one thing good that these people did. They did not forget God. God, though they were going through these things, and that is perhaps the pivotal key to this whole situation. Yeah, these people are going through some things. They look at the story's past and they think, man, the Christian life is supposed to be easy. Our fathers made it look so easy. Our fathers told us as if it were easy. And now it seems like God's not working in my life. Now it seems like everybody around me is against me and God's not even putting them down. He's not reproaching them. He's not putting shame upon them. Everyone's after me. God's turned against me. Forget God. No. These people remembered God, and that was probably the best thing that they could do in this situation. Why? Because they are now experiencing the same thing their fathers did. And uh, though the fathers didn't seem to portray it well enough, um, they are now going through those same things. So don't, in this time, don't forget God or decline from his way. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The Bible says in another place, then being in the way, the Lord led me. 
I believe that's what we need to do. The steps of a good man. Well, he was good to begin with. The good man's steps. Well, that was ordered by the Lord. The good man's steps. That was ordered by the Lord. The other illustration is this. Being in the way, the Lord's hand comes in and leads me. He finds a way to take the good man's steps and make them into a perfect order by manipulating the scenario before him. And then he takes the person that is already in the way, doing what they were commanded, doing what the Bible said, doing what their master said, being in that way, the Lord led me. The same thing is true. There was already a motion. There was already a forward motion. There was already something, a direction. There was already his way, being in the Lord's way. Don't forget that God is there in that situation. Don't forget God in, his, in this situation. Why? Because then he's able to do exactly what he said. Being in the way the Lord will lead you, and he will order those steps of the good man. In verse 20, if we have forgotten the name of our God, or stretched out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of our heart. So we need to understand that, yes, God is there. Don't forget him. And don't decline from his ways. We should also understand and remember that God knows. God knows your cares. God knows your worries. God knows your doubts, your sufferings, your fears. God knows the trials that you are going in. God knows if we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands toward a strange God. So now God search even this out. These people are realizing that, hey, hey, we are walking in the way of God. We haven't forgotten God. And though we feel like he's forgotten us, though we feel like he's put us away, though we feel like all of the approach that's coming upon us from our neighbors is somehow our fault, is somehow God just working against us. The reality is we haven't forgotten him. And if in fact we are in sin, he knows that. So we need to recognize, hey, God does know everything. And that should be a warm feeling to the Christian. He knows what you're going through. And the Bible says in verse 22, Yea, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. So even unto the point of death, God knows what you're going through. God knows that year killed all the day long. He understood that these people were killed all the day long, that they were going through this great trial, that they were going through these great hard times, that they were walking through them and they were wondering why things weren't in the days of their fathers, why things weren't as they were in the days of their fathers. The Bible warns against even that attitude. It's not wise to ask that type of question. But even unto death, God knows what these people are going through. So we need to not look at minor, minor spiritual losses as if you have lost favor with God. Don't regard reproach from your neighbor as if it comes by reason of error. In other words, that's your default. In other words, I've sinned and so all these people are hating me or, or, or I've done wrong and all these people are hating me. Don't forget God or decline from his ways. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. When we forget God, we're not acknowledging God and the path becomes fuzzy. Bible's clear. Recognize that God knows even unto the death. None of us have suffered unto blood. The Bible records that in one spot. Though these people are going through that in the book of Psalms. They are experiencing being killed all the day long. We ourselves can't practically say that we have been pushed to that limit. The next thing in verse 23. Awake, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. Wherefore hidest thou thy face, and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust, our belly cleaveth unto the earth. Arise for our help, and redeem us for thy mercy's sake. So it's an interesting thing that, okay, there's this kind of balance where, yes, the fathers didn't explain clearly, perhaps, that the Christian life is a struggle. But then it's almost like this, this thing that perhaps they did explain it and, and the children didn't get it. But either way, you kind of see them go through the same cycle. The next point I want to make is that the Lord is not asleep. Seek him. <clears throat> so what we do is we see, oh, God's not even working in my life. Everything's working against me. You start to forget God, decline from his ways. Things just get worse and worse and worse. Eventually, verse 20, you decline into sin. Even unto the death, you're just, you're just doing wrong and things aren't going good. But then it says, it's awake, why sleepest thou? Now this person is recognizing that God is there. And he's calling out to him, awake. 
But the reality is, is that God's not asleep, and we can seek him at any time. And I think the full cycle, the full circle of this, and the best way that we can carry on into 2019 without complaint is to recognize, yes, all these things are working in a certain way in our lives in order that in the end, God would get glorified in blessing us and putting down our enemies. The reality is, is that those circumstances, those trials, those struggles are in our lives and they're, they're there almost just like the thorn in Paul, the messenger from Satan that was sent to buffet him, to keep him humble. The Lord is not asleep. We can seek him and these trials are there to do what you see in verse 25. Our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly cleaveth unto the earth and the prayer is made arise for our help. The purpose of God putting these trials in our life is to put your belly in the dust. The purpose of the trials in your life is to put you bowed down onto the earth in order that you would say, God, arise, help me, redeem us for thy mercy's sake. So these children that have heard the great tales of the fathers and the great things that God have done have just come full circle to the point where they're in the dirt praying to God to arise and redeem them for thy mercy's sake. And do you know what God's going to do? He's going to start Psalm 44 again. And we're going to hear in the ears from these how God did drive out the struggles, how God did drive out those that were fighting against these people, those that were killing them all the day long. We're going to hear the great stories as these as this story almost unfolds itself and unfolds itself and unfolds itself. So what am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to say is that there were great things that have happened in this past year. And when we tell it, as we often do, we're going to embellish to the side of the positive. We're going to try to encourage people in the fact that good things, really good things, really great things the Lord hath done through this church. And it's right to do so. We also got to remember ourselves as we go forward. If we were now transitioning into the period of the children, we need to understand that it's not right for us to look at our losses as if we're losing favor with God and then start to look at our neighbors as they're acting towards us as if the whole world's just turning against us again. And then we're going to forget God and then we're going to fall into sorrow and then we're going to be broken down. Unless our plan is eventually to rise up and to pray to God again, fall upon our knees and, and ask him for help and we do the cycle again, I think it would be a lot easier if we just recognized here and now that, yeah, the Christian life and, and indeed this church life, and indeed everything that's gone on so far, was both easy and hard, was both a blessing and, and, and a curse, some things that happened to us. But if we can put aside the specifics of the negatives, forgive and forget, step forward with the great things that God has done, the positive things that God has done, understanding that those negatives were a part of the great blessing that had happened. And that's why by comparison, we know how good things can be at this church and how good it can be to be with good loving people and how great it can be to see God answer prayers. God, get people saved. God strengthen us as believers. How great it can be. We know that by comparison to all of the kind of rotten things that happened. And those had to be there in order for us to be in the same situation that we are at. So the best way to carry on without complaint is to carry on remembering the great things God hath done, but also remembering that those came with a cost. Those came with a price. And as we step forward into 2019, we're going to have the exact same thing happen to us. We're going to have great things happen to us, and there will always be that underlining, contrasting, fighting back enemy spirit. Because if you're going to do great things for God, you got to know, you got to understand, you got to count on the fact that the devil is waiting there to do great harm to you. Because he doesn't want this church to be here. He doesn't want these believers to be here. He doesn't want us to be seeking God. He doesn't want us to be on our bellies praying for this church, praying for one another, praying for the souls that we will see saved. But that is my hope, is that we will go on into the next year without a spirit of complaint when struggles come, when, when, when fighting returns, when, when the battle's hot again. We won't complain about those things, but we will understand that those are there to keep us on our knees, to keep us on our bellies, to keep us praying unto God that he would work in the situations, and in the end, his right hand and his arm 
and the light of his countenance and the favor that he has towards us will be ultimately the push, ultimately the motivation, ultimately the strength that we have to lean on, to trust in, and to grow thereby. God would get all the glory, and we would just simply be along for the ride. Without complaint, we can trust in him, and we can carry on into this next year, and into this next season of our lives. And I believe God is going to do great things through these believers. He's going to do great things through this church. If we simply trust in him, pray unto him, don't get bitter on him.